Welcome, everybody. I'm joined by Chuck Kallenbach, and we are here to talk uh, a range of topics. Star Wars CCG, Lord of the Rings CCG, Young Jedi, which uh, all of these Chuck had a hand in designing and playtesting. Uh, I have a foil Realm of the Elf Lords from Lord of the Rings TCG framed in the back, and he's like, oh, I designed those cards. And I was yeah. like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> that's so a, That's a good one. I love that, yeah. Uh, we have a really fun show ahead of you, uh, us here with, with Chuck, and uh, the big thing, I, I want to just kind of walk through what you've worked on. Uh, we're, we have a bunch of questions from the audience. I, I had like over 100 questions people sent me, so unfortunately, I can't get through everything. But uh, Chuck, welcome. You've had the dream job for many people. Can you tell us kind of how you got there and what you've worked on? And you're retired now, so you, you got some time to, to reminisce. So I I'd can, love to hear. I can do that, yeah. I, I often think about how the heck did this all happen? Um, <laughs> I wish I had... I want to tell everybody if I was, you know, selling this video, it would be, uh, you know, here's the three ways you're going to do it. And here's my secret tip. But really, if, as I go through the story, you're going to see there's a lot of luck involved. So as there always is this game designing, becoming a game designer was my second career. My first career was I was a graphic artist. That's what I went to college for. And that's uh, uh, what I did for 20 years. And uh, basically, Magic the Gathering came out. I said, I like card games. This is great. I really like it a lot. And um, uh my wife worked for a um, a game store. It w really was just a game store, not games and comics, but just games, which is very odd in the St. Louis area, which is where I grew up. And uh, uh, they were friends with a number of uh, companies. And uh, Mayfair, the company, I don't, are they still around? I don't know. You can do some games, right? Yeah, I and, think I've. Uh, yeah, came by and, and there was a barbecue. I went to the barbecue, and uh, the guys from Mayfair had given her boss, a packet, just an envelope. And they said, it's for playtesting. And he said, oh, and he took it and he threw it at me. And he said, you like playing games, so take this. <laughs> and that was the Star Trek CCG, the alpha design, I guess we'd call it alpha at this point. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so, you know, that started a, a, a playtesting career in earnest. And honestly, that was my, my first uh, uh, avenue to get to uh, um, becoming a game designer. Let me let me back up just a bit. I'm gonna talk about a company that nobody knows about. We used to play the Traveler RPG. We, my friend and I made a company called uh, Paranoia Press and we made supplements uh, for Traveler and sold them and they were licensed and everything. And this was back in 1981 or so. So my first answer is, how do you become a game designer? My first answer is start your own company. <laughs> then you are the game designer. So that doesn't really help anybody, but that's the first time it happened. That's my first story. So now let's go back. This is like a TV show. I just watched it jump back and forth, you know, like 10 years later. Okay. All right. Anyway. So I'm at this party at the barbecue. They throw this thing at me. It's got Star Trek inside. I get on uh, what was very high tech. This was 1995, I think. Uh, the Genie message board it was a bulletin board on the internet. I know it sounds crazy back then. Uh, and that's what they did with their playtesting. It was the olden days. So they sent you paper copies of cards. You would cut them out, you would play them. And then you would uh, go on this message board and write back, this card is okay and this card is good. I was, um, we played a lot of games. I was uh, 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 supportive. I mean, I was positive. You know, it's best if you don't, whoever you're working with, it's best if you don't say, this card is crap. You know, say, well, <laughs> this card didn't work quite the way we wanted it to. Here's some suggestions for how to fix it. So it's always being positive. And if you find a problem, if there's a problem with something, uh, we didn't like this and we think it should be like that. Make a suggestion, make a positive suggestion. That's how to how to be a good play tester. So um, we did that for a while. The original, if you saw these games back then, they didn't look much like the games that you actually played. Uh, and there was one weird thing that happened that I always thought was strange. Even back then, I wasn't exactly an expert game designer, but I played a lot of games. And they said, the Star Trek CCG, if you remember, basically you could play one card a turn. There wasn't really a cost system. You could play one card a turn. One of the guys who worked on the original design of the game before we got a hold of it said, we noticed that people weren't playing a lot of cards on their turn. And we were like, yeah. And he said, so we made a card called Red Alert so that you could play all the cards in your hand. And we went, yeah. And then we all looked at each other because Red Alert was broken as hell. But uh, <laughs> that's kind of the level of game design they had there. Um, anyway, 
uh, the cipher was was very lucky to get the licenses that they did because that uh, you know in 1996 or whatever 95 when did Star Wars CCG oh wait I have a list over here I think it was uh 95 yeah late Christmas? 95 it was a like Christmas yeah. 95 right if, if you said I have a collectible card game on Star Wars everybody would say I'd take three boxes you know that didn't care how it played so uh, it was going to sell anyway anyway um, so my answer is uh, be a good play tester. Uh, be responsive and and read the other people's comments and take them into account too. Be constructive. Uh, eventually, they said uh, on that bullet board, they said, "Do you want to? We're getting a Star Wars game. Do you want to play test that?" And I thought about it, uh, not at all. And I said, "Yeah, I'd like to do that." Um, so um, again, they sent me cards and spreadsheets and things, and we we played it, and it was. <laughs> It was a mess. Uh, it had a lot. It looked the Star Wars game looked more like Star Wars CCG, if you just looked at the playtest cards. Uh, but for example, there was no force drain. Oh, you see, you have a friend. That's nice. Yeah, sorry. I, <laughs> she, she's <laughs> curious about game design as well. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, so uh, yeah, so there were a lot of problems. The, the, we on the first day we played. Oh, I'll tell you the Devastator Chuck story. In our play test with dark side basically all you needed was like if you got vader and a devastator into play uh uh you were uh going to win <laughs> that's pretty much all there was to it there were unopposed battles at that time that was considered the big problem on the first day because i just play things and i fight and i have you know 10 power of guys here and you take 10 cards off your deck everybody says that's not right so uh i was nine and one on the first day with my <laughs> devastator deck best star wars player ever um and i'm honestly i'm not uh, my career is not based on my ability to play games well <laughs> mm. that's not what i did for a living for 20 years so uh that was my high debt my high point of my career right there my playing career my tournament career uh <laughs> the next day uh mark tuttle that invented force drain he said well what if you could only do as much damage as you know the other guy's lightsabers and we were like and i was like i don't care my my deck will still destroy you. And it didn't. It was really tough for me to win. So that was good. So we went on from there. Um, my, I, I had doodled a card called Field Promotion in the margin of one of these spreadsheets, and it became a card. I was like, that's nice. I never thought to ask these guys if, if they would hire me. I was in St. Louis. <laughs> they were in Norfolk, Virginia. They would fly you out for a playtest. I had done playtesting for games before, and they said, well, we're going to have a playtest weekend, and we want to fly you out and put you up in a hotel and I said, that's it's not literally normal. A great weekend. <laughs> Again, easy, yes. Yeah. But, you know, now that I look at it, they were kind of feeling us out. You know, is this guy a jerk? Does he smell funny? Let's find out what this guy's like. And it's not just me, there are other people too. There are lots of people at the play test. <clears throat> so, uh, and I came home and I, I'd done this a couple times with Star Wars. Star Wars came out. I remember going back to Hoth and I was the guy that said, let's number the sites on Hoth. First marker, second marker, third marker. I said, that, but didn't they do that in the movie? Because we were having trouble with the sites coming out and so we got a goofy order. So that was my main contribution to Hoth, I guess. Um, <laughs> and uh, there's always something you can put your finger on, like, oh, that card. I did that card. That was me. So, uh, yeah. So I did play testing. I flew back out a, a couple more times. Uh, and then finally, they sent me a letter and they said, would you like to come work for us? And I said, okay. That was in 97. So a couple sets had gone by. I know that the first set that I, the, the set that was being done when I got there was Cloud City. And then I worked on Java's Palace right after that. Um, and I remember the, the, well, at the Hoth plate test, they said, this is the rule sheet. And the rule sheets were like, I don't know, four feet long or something. And I said, people are going to hate this. <laughs> this is terrible. You can't they haven't this. gotten any shorter. <laughs> yeah, no, they haven't. They kept getting longer. And people loved it. And I thought, well. That's so weird. I think it's having worked on a couple dozen other games. I think that people will go through so much <laughs> because it's a Star Wars game. And I think you also have the people know the IP. So when you have the rules, I mean, when you have the rules, it says you got to have Han in Cloud City and you got to be at that carbon freezing chamber and Boba Fett has to be there. And then you have to take it back to Tatooine and and take it to the Jabba's Palace location. That's insane. 
but it's what happened in the movie, so everybody knew how it worked. It was like, uh, okay, just just do the movie. That's I'll also, just say so. I, you know, I was like a, a child of the '90s, but I was like playing this when I was like 12, 13, 14, 15, and we did not know how to play, right? Yeah. But you could bluff enough where it's like, well, my Han, th this card says he's power four, and your your guy's power <laughs> two, so oh, that means I'm better. You know, and it, like it, it was an easy game to sort of bluff. Just like playing totally incorrectly, <laughs> you can kind yeah. of figure it out a little bit. Yes. Um, and, I used to I used to call that beating your opponent with the rule stick, which is uh, it doesn't. I just have to know the rules a little bit better than you do, and then I'm going to tell you you're wrong. And you know, if there's not a judge there, if there was a judge there, he's probably very busy. Um, but I know that a lot of the and this is the kind of thing that got Star Wars fans to hate me uh, when I said this happened a lot and the rules were not very tight they mm. were not they were not uh well uh, well written they just kind of rolled along like you know snowball well, i think it's easy look, to look at this all through the lens of like a modern gaming lens where you know we think of things as okay resource management is a key component of card games drawing and using your hand and you know it's because we've had 25 plus years of experience, but in 95, the idea of resource management was not necessarily like it. It was almost incidental how it happened. It's like, oh, all these games you have to pay something to get a card out and uh, drawing is actually a very powerful mechanic. And I don't think right. people realize that until like 95, 96, 97. That's that like, absolutely true, yeah. The idea of control or removal, like all these concepts that now are, are staples of gaming, but you didn't yeah. really think like, this is a removal deck. Oh, what does that mean? And I, you know, I'm not sure that we knew a whole lot about that, but you know, I wasn't there when they wrote the original Star Wars rule book. I was there when they wrote the glossary, which was something. Um, and uh, it just, I look back on it now and it looks, it looks unfinished to me. It looks sloppy. And um, so, but like you say, it was a long time ago <laughs> and uh, it, it worked well enough to sell, you know, like a hundred million dollars worth of cards. So I guess that's, I guess that's fine. That's, that's a win there. I think. Yeah. We're not going to uh, call it a flop. Yeah. Okay, so you came into Decipher. It's like '97. You officially joined the team, and you were sort of playtester, game designer at that point for Star Wars CCG. What? So, what sets did you kind of start working on at that point? I uh, was more of a game designer than a playtester because after a while, they started hiring people that had played the game a lot that were really good at it. Like Tom Lischke was number one for a long time. Uh, and he was in St. Louis with me. We rode out to the Hawk playtest together, and uh, but he was a very good player and an excellent playtester. And 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 good players make good designers too. Um, but it's not exactly the same thing. And um, the thing that I learned, the thing that shaped my career uh, as a game designer was, Decipher had almost always uh, licensed products. So. Mm -hmm. We looked at we. I was never the kind of guy that had like, uh, yeah, I got a couple of game designs I want you to try that I made up last weekend and I built all the cards and did it myself. I was never that guy. I was the guy who, when the company would come to me and say, "We have a game on, uh, uh, you know, Lord of the Rings," I say, "Well, I read the books and I got some ideas, so let's go. We're gonna we're gonna make the making the game look like the story that we read or the movie that we watched or whatever. It's an interpretive kind of thing." So uh, that was my job. That was my uh, profession at that point. Uh, it, it got very funny later on when I tried to make it into video games because I thought nobody's going to be playing paper card games now. It's all going to be video games. <laughs> also wrong. Uh, but um, when I got to that point, it was I'm not a programmer. I don't know how to program at all. And uh, I'm not a very good player. So how the hell did I have a career? Um, uh, it's just... As it turns out, I have a career in uh, commercial art, uh, my degree, I'm sorry, I should say, in commercial art and advertising design. And I should have taken more creative writing classes because that's really what I was doing. Not just now, the writing game text is a very technical thing. And it's a very, um, if you know a lot about uh, grammar, you know, from the English standpoint and, and how parts of speech function, and I don't want to get too technical, but if you know how to write stuff, and you know why stuff is written that way, then that's good for game text. We were just talking about like the game text on Alpha Magic cards was horrible, just terrible. And you can see it on Scryfall now. You can see, oh, geez. Um, so, but they fixed that. And there were a lot of problems with, with Star Wars too. Things like the whole thing about just played. I don't know how much Star Wars you play, but 
if, if so-and-so, if your opponent has just played blah, you can play this. So that was a timing thing. And we based it on the fact that the card said just played on it. So we had like just actions. That was dumb. All that was dumb. We, I liked when we were playing L5R at the same time, you know, because it came out about the same time. And they had actions that said reaction, which means you play this when somebody else does something. I'm like, that's good. <laughs> we should do that. And I was like, no, we can't do it now. Um, Star Wars was very much designed to be not Magic the Gathering. So, uh, you know, there was not a separate life total. There was no card limit that four cards copy of a card per deck that's crazy we're not doing that and uh some of the things that magic had implemented like the stack and some other things were we didn't do that uh, intentionally it was supposed to be not like magic and an alternative a, a point of differentiation is what they say in, in marketing circles i guess i'm not a marketer either um well i mean the but, 90s uh, was filled with magic clones right and yeah. i think you wanted to that's how you differentiated yourself is this right. is not magic but it's still a card game right 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 and it's a yeah that's what we did so uh, often we brought up things and it was like no that's that we can't do that because that magic is like that mm. the fact that all of our stuff the cypher games had locations is really weird if you think about it i mean who else mm. did that not, not not many people so um that was a big difference right there um and that was uh that was good. That was part of the success. I shouldn't, I shouldn't downgrade that, but, uh, it was a wonderful ride. Uh, again, I worked on, you want to know what I worked on at decipher? Well, almost everything you can think of. I didn't, when I first got to decipher, I was put on first contact for star Trek and Mark Tuttle was already there. And he said to me, uh, ha ha, that's funny because you thought star Trek was multiple solitaire. Ha ha. Now you're working on it. I said, <laughs> well, shut up. I have a job now. So, uh, so I worked on first contact and, uh, um, and then I guess I got to go on, uh, a job's palace. Uh, it was mostly me and Jerry Darcy doing the initial design work. And, uh, I took, we split the aliens in half. I think, I think I had the light side ones and he had the dark side ones or something like that. We need a bunch of alien cards. Let's get fine. Let's do that. Um, how did so, you come up with some of the aliens in Java's palace? Cause some of them like. It was you know were you just kind of inventing names for some of these guys like there's like that three-eyed guy who's power three ability three i'm like three, yeah, i don't yeah. know if there's existing lore for that stuff right you just oh, kind of come up with names yeah when we went to the in fact we went to the very first play test before premiere came out there was a guy there from uh whoever it was that was writing the books there was a book called tales of java's palace or something tales of bounty hunters so those were kind of out there before we got there and we would check things with him we'd say well what do you want to do this with boba fett what do you think and he's like well well yeah we could do that and he would suggest things from the books which was great that was great so a lot of that stuff came from there um back in those days the uh lucasfilm did not name everything so we named a lot of guys and there's <laughs> i suppose i don't know if you run across the anagram thing but there there are a lot of anagrams of like there's a character called uh Arleel Schaus, which is an anagram for Charles Lewis, which is my first two names. So we named cards after each other, after our pets. We named, uh, <laughs> there's a General Navarre, which is named after my dog, Raven. Um, so we named a lot of stuff. And, and Lucas, Lucas, I worked with so many licensors and I was often the point guy that actually talked to people on the phone. And Lucas was the best because you would say, hey, we want to name this Navarre. And they'd say, nobody's named it yet. So I'm writing that down. You know, that's the way they were. We don't care. We, we just let it go. You're helping us out. Uh, you know, and they were selling stuff to comic books and everything. So it just grew and grew and grew. There's a guy named Leland Chi, who is the uh, uh, Holocron Keeper. I think it's his job title. And he has some kind of massive database. And I chatted with him a lot because we would put out a set and I'd say, Leila, is our stuff in there, man? Do you know? He said, I know who you are. I know your stuff is all written down. I said, okay, that's fine. So uh, that was awesome getting the name stuff. By the time we got to episode one, by the time we got to, oh, well, Young Jedi, uh, they named everything. I was like, wow. Cause uh, you know, they said, well, if we're going to make a toy out of this guy, you never know. So uh, they named everything. And the only thing I could name from the Phantom Menace was a cab driver, taxi driver, who was only seen in a deleted scene. <laughs> His name was Reno Vaca or something like that. That didn't mean anything. That was nobody I knew. But... Yeah, I was kind of disappointed we couldn't name everything. Um, 
so kind of moving along the timeline, you worked on Star Wars CCG stuff, and then did you touch the New Hope set, or I'm sorry, the Episode One stuff, or was it you started with First Contact, and then you kind of moved to Jabba's Palace, Cloud City? Did you ever hand in Dagobah, the sort of most hated set of all Star Wars CCG sets? Why do I think I don't think I worked too much on Dagobah? I was a little weirded out. There was like a plan for what, because it's pretty obvious if you look. There's a, a we're dividing every movie in half. I think is that right? I think that's right. Yeah, we're based on planets, halves or thirds. Man, it's been a long time. Um, so they got to Dagobah and they said, well, there's only going to be like two light side characters. We all went, what? <laughs> that's not going to work. <laughs> so oh, wait, you see these rules we've got. And I was like, I must have been working on something else. Let's see, what was I working on? I don't know. Tracking what? Okay, I can't remember what I was working on six weeks ago. So <laughs> I know what you mean. Yeah, I thought I had this thing written down here where I'd be able to figure all this out, but no, that's not true. Um, yeah, I got involved. I had told Warren and, and the the higher up peoples that uh, what I really wanted to do was whenever you had a new game, I wanted to work on the new game. Mm. I said that's what I want. They said okay, so we got to work on Young Jedi. We got to oh. And we we got some preliminary stuff from Young Jedi. And unusually, there was uh, actually two competing designs for Young Jedi. And it was one that the rest of us, normal people, the guys that always did the designing came up with. And there was another one that uh, Raleigh and Tom came up with. Raleigh and Tom had their own design company and they had wow. done the original version of Star Trek. They were uh, uh, people that Warren knew and trusted them very much. Um, so, uh, we went head to head with them and like they had a color printer and they had access to artwork and we had black and white star wars cards and it was and so i said before the play test where we were showing both the games i said well listen don't you have to take into account that we're just talking gameplay here we got to get the best game it's not about who's looks the best so as soon as we got done with our presentations the ross the vice president said well that one looks the best i think he was making a joke otherwise it would make me very angry <laughs> but uh, it was their design we went with, the design that eventually became Young Jedi. And um, so before that game was finalized, we were flown out to uh, uh, Lucasfilm. We were flown out to the ranch, and we had a very nice lunch there, and we saw some preview stuff. There was a hundred, hundreds maybe, of licensees that, that Lucas brought about and said, here's the, here's the movie, we'll tell you everything we can tell you. And we saw things like animatics of Jar Jar, but we didn't hear him talk. The animatics were, I don't know, like, I don't know, it's hard to explain them. It's like lousy cartoons from the 60s. They look like animatics. They did those before they animated the whole thing. So uh, we thought, that's kind of some weird stuff going on there and little Anakin's weird. And, you know, we came out going, yeah, this is cool. We can do this. And then we went to a big, like we did, uh, Warren would, I don't know, I think he hired the whole theater. We would all go, uh, about a hundred of us and watch the movie. And when we came out of that movie, people were not happy. It was not the movie they were looking for. And I thought, well, I said, you know, I think it had two really good scenes. And they were like, oh, no, that Jar Jar guy is terrible. I said, all right, all right. So that's how I ended up designing. This, like, this is what I call falling on a grenade. This is what you do. So every once in a while, you got to fall on a grenade. So I'll do the YJ thing. Nobody likes the movies. So I did work on that. And that, unusually, I did YJ almost all by myself. Um, almost everything else done at Decipher was a, a very much a group project. There would be something that was hands on deck, which is like, we're going to work on the Star Trek thing now for a month. And then we're going to go work on the Star Wars thing. And it was like four or five of us that went from place to place. And, and, uh, it was a long time, I think, before we got two different teams working on Star Trek and Star Wars. And, uh, uh we met once walking down the street, the Star Trek and the Star Wars group and all the Star Trek guys had beards and we thought maybe they were from a mirror universe or something. It was very strange. <laughs> but I mean, we were friendly and we helped out. And it's always good to get a, another perspective. Like if somebody's not working on, we used to ask people when they joined the company, have you played our games? No, I've never played a game. Oh, great, great. Don't play anything. Because we always wanted to test a new game with people that never played a game like this before. And mm -hmm. all of us were horribly jaded and had played so many games uh, that you couldn't get any decent feedback from us. So that that was a rite of passage for all the you're in the mail room well listen don't play any games we're gonna we're gonna need you here in a few weeks um so uh so yeah young jedi i got <laughs> i did a lot of weird things with young jedi uh it, the original idea was to like not have game text on anything and we pretty much didn't have game text on anything 
uh, I think it was like in the third set, we put some game text on some characters. It was like, oh my God, they've invented something brand new. I said, no, it's not really new. It was really trying to make it very, very simple at the beginning. Well, I was supposed to say elegant or rules light or something, but you know, after a while, well, well, it's like a foil to Star Wars CCG, which by 2001 is overly complex, right? It's it's just too many interactions, too many things to consider. Uh, it, I, I don't know, like broken cards. We'll get into all of that sort of the audience questions, but it's, it's a nice foil, right, to uh, Star Wars CCG and the complexity there to have something simple. For... It was nice that it was something different. And we went to, they used to take us and like they sent me to Maryland and I would go from Maryland to Maine. And I would, that weekend, I would be at 10 different hobby shop, shops and I would be doing demos, talking about our stuff coming out, meeting the people, lots of fun. I call it barnstorming tours. And uh, uh, when we went out on tours like that, the, there were younger people playing YJ and there were uh, a different group of people because it wasn't like, before that, you were a Decipher gamer. You played Star Trek. Oh, I got Star Wars. I'll play that too. You know, we didn't get a lot of, uh, Star Wars brought in a lot of new people, but there was like this group of decipher gamers but we wanted to spread out from that of course as much as possible yj was a real moment to do that i'm looking at my list of stuff um so i got to do uh lots of things making lots of things matter uh including a game mechanic that was based on the uh collector's numbers of cards i don't know mm. if you remember that there was a pod racing mechanic that was based on you had to have a pod racer and his collector number determined something. I don't know what it was like. Uh, there's an old statement about Native Americans would use every part of the Buffalo. It was like that. It was like, I'm going to use every part of the card. Every part of the card is important, including the collector number. So, so I think we're, we're right around 2001 working on young Jedi. So I, I guess I kind of have a question for you, you know, sure. what it was like at Decipher and to late 2000, you know, I'm sure, Actually, I'm sure you knew that the license was being lost mid-2001 or something. And it's sort of like the best of times and worst of times because you're scoring Lord of the Rings, arguably the, the biggest franchise coming out that decade, right? And also, uh, this goddamn cat. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> she just, I texted Sorry. my significant other to come get her, but she's just like... <laughs> shouldn't have shut the door. I didn't know she was hiding in here. Anyways, <laughs> uh, so you kind of have a bit of a tale of two cities where it's on one hand that the best of times and, and worst of times, right? Because you're losing one giant license and you're gaining another giant license. And I'm just kind of curious what it was like inside Decipher at that time, because it seems like we're excited, but sad <laughs> at the same time, <laughs> bittersweet. Um, I can tell you that I think most of the designers, certainly me and Tom more than anybody, but most of the designers felt like um, we're getting Lord of the Rings. What? Who? Who? Uh, Warren, can I wash your car tomorrow morning? Can I get on that? Oh, can I do that Lord of the Rings thing? And he was like, yeah, everybody's going to work on it. It's fine. And he would say things like, uh, okay, we have Jedi Knights and we have Young Jedi and we have to get these sets taken care of. So you have to get these sets. I'm like, okay, let's go to work. Um, and uh, we were working very hard to get Jedi Knights out the door. And uh, Young Jedi went on for... I think six sets or something like that. I think the yeah, I think it was five on. plus reflections. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I named that reflection set, by the way. The original reflections was the word I came up with. That's actually that's a that's a significant contribution. <laughs> I thought it was pretty good. Nobody knows that but me, so I'll tell you that right now. Um, we we kind of joke in the the collecting community that you know reflections came out whenever Decipher needed some money. <laughs> so it's like a cash grab, right? Like we package up some old cards, old product, put it in a package, throw some shiny things in there, and you know, sell it for six bucks a pack. You figured that out, did you? That's very smart of you. Uh, there was there was a guy who who wrote to us and he said, "I sell uh, uh, farming implements, and it's like you took a shovel and and you put some some gold foil on it or something, and uh, and then you sell it for extra money." He said, "That's crazy." He thought that was incredible, and I just, was like, "Yeah." Well, the real thing about that was a decipher. Uh, this is a thing I wouldn't say if it was, you know, 2001 right now. Decipher ordered really big print runs of everything. Mm. And uh, uh, I mean, I don't know anything about how you order a print run or how do you figure out what you're going to sell of a game. But we had a lot of cards laid around in the warehouse. So you're right that those cards had a number of foil cards uh, on the on the front of the pack. Right. And then they had a bunch of other stuff in them. And that was designed to move some old stuff out of the warehouse is really what that was for. Um, 
Yeah, makes so sense. That was a thing that I mean, I Warren is very welcoming and he also believes in getting lots of people's opinions on things. I remember talking about being in a meeting talking about the card back for uh, the dot hack game. Um uh, which I mean, nobody I ever worked for before asked me what a card back should look like. So that was great. That was cool. Warren Warren's very good about that. Warren's very inclusive. Um, so where are we? 2001. Yeah. Um, so, so, so sort of the excitement over getting Lord of the Rings killed out the the bummer that Star. I mean, Star Wars CCG in 2001 was also just like it needed a reboot, right? And so maybe that's a yeah. question. Was there a reboot sort of quietly planned Star Wars? I mean. Special edition was a soft re relaunch, essentially a premiere, and you know you got Trek 2.0. Would you have had Star Wars CCG 2.0? Uh, technically, we did that. If you think that's what Wars was, technically. Mm, yeah, but, yeah. But I talked about some of the uh, inconsistencies of the Wars engine, and in Wars TCG when it came out, we said, well, we're going to use the Wars engine, but we're going to fix it. So we put a stack in it. We made, we were very careful about writing the. If you look at a card from Wars versus Star Wars cards, the, the the Wars cards look more like a card from L5R or maybe a card from Magic uh, in terms of having keywords and uh, uh, timing that worked. <laughs> I mean, improved timing, let me say that right away. A lot of people played Star Wars, they don't seem to, they seem to work this timing stuff out, but as far as I was concerned, it was not, it's not good. So uh, that's what we did. And we put our own IP on Wars, which, I got involved in late, but it was a lot of fun for me. I really enjoyed that a lot. I honestly love the Wars IP. I'm like, oh, th th it's kind of like the Expanse, right? Like, I, I it is, yeah. Uh, oh. Wish the game had had a bit more legs, but I think you know, just sort of dead on arrival almost. I don't. know. They told me about it, and I was like, this is the science fiction that I want to read about. It's not, it's not Star Trek with gazillions of every week's a different planet. It was, it was our solar system. This is it. There's, you know, four or five planets and factions and stuff. And a couple came from outside and stuff. And uh, I thought it was great. I really enjoyed it a lot. And I started uh, writing stories for it. I wrote very short stories, but that's kind of, I don't know, it's the way I write. I've never written a novel. So I wrote point of view stories like what if the, the guy that looks like a big blue dolphin is on a war thing and he's worried about his family, you know, so I, I wrote it with letters home and stuff. Uh, I wrote the point of view of a robot that had his arm torn off. I, I, I thought it was fun. Um, and then people yeah, I, would, I would read all of that. I mean, honestly, you, you put it together in a <laughs> short story collection. I, I, I'm, yeah. I, um, <laughs> they, um, so I wrote little stories like that. And then other people in the office said, can I write a story? I said, sure. So I found myself editing other people's stories, which was a very new experience to me because I immediately started editing them like my stories. It was like, no, I don't use adverbs. Get those out. And I had to, whoa, stop. When you're, or, when you're editing someone else's stuff, you have to make it sound like them. You know, it, you have to look at it differently. Very educational for me in terms of, again, creative writing, which I was never trained to do, but I did a lot of. Uh, eventually, everybody complained about the short stories and Mark Tuller wrote a big two-part story, I think, uh, which is great. I really liked that a lot. And I don't know if you know who Michael Stackpole is, but he was a, a science fiction writer who yeah. I met. I met him long, like, like, uh, like when uh, when D and D came out, nineteen seventy seven or something. I met Mike. We were friends for a long time, and he wrote stuff for Wars. Gave me a lot of tips about how to build worlds and stuff, which is great. He said, uh, "Never say always, and never say never." <laughs> mm -hmm. So because you could never go back and do it again. If you say, "Well, that's never that, that will never happen," you say, "Well, it's probably not likely that will happen because you can leave all these doors open, you know, for making more stuff." Anyway, so Mike wrote stuff. And he would say things like blah, 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 planet name here, because we had to figure out, you know, what planet it was coming or what, what starship it was or whatever. So I edited his stuff and I, that was exciting for me. <laughs> um, and he was very helpful with the process of getting that going. Um, we made some mistakes back then. Um, the naming of the man, I was one of the people who fought to have the game name wars. And that was wrong. So <laughs> I was about wrong. to say. <laughs> That was if you go search for it right now, you can't. You have to say like on Google, you say Wars TCG minus Star. <laughs> I I still think the game should have been just called Incursion, right? Like the first set was called Incursion, right? Like that's a fun word. It's it's unique. It rolls off the tongue. That would have been okay. Uh, it was going to be called the Moomon Rift, and then the guys that made the uh, TCG tabletop RPG named uh, Rift. 
did not like that. So, well, also like Moomon, I'm like, how do you spell Moomon? Moo, moo, moo. like, you know, M-U-M-O-N. It was based on some philosopher or something. We used to have names for stories that were, well, I could look them up, but they were very poetic and philosophical and I don't know what they meant. We I, we would write the stories and we just say, you just put this name on there. It doesn't matter. That's what one mean, thing I really do appreciate about Decipher as a company is is there's so many Easter eggs and, and you know, yeah. little treasures left in card lores. And sometimes, uh, you know, like it's like very poetic the way they, I, I'm just like, oh, this is, I like stumble across an old card. Uh, like I think in, in uh, Star Trek, there's a card, Rules of Acquisition, where it says, mm -hmm. you know, war is good for business or something. I'm like, oh yeah, that's a little darker tone. <laughs> I think and I was, appreciate it. The rules of acquisition were great. Those were from, uh, I didn't work on that, but that was the Ferengi, I think, that had rules of acquisition. And uh, I don't know if we made up any new ones, but they were all good stuff. Yeah. They were, they were all very good. Um, so what else did we work on then? Austin Powers, I didn't really work on. They called me over to play test Austin Powers and they told me the mechanic where you put your finger up like this. There's like, there's a, there's a thing that happens during the game and everybody puts their finger up like this, like Dr. Evil. And whoever does it last uh, discards a card or something. I don't know. And so we did this a couple times and I was like, this is ridiculous. You can't have any rules to make this work. And they looked at me and they said, it's a party game, Chuck. And I was like, okay, that's fine. You, you're, you don't go to parties, Chuck. So you wouldn't, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're not fun. So I, I see people still playing that game. That's great. It's, that was a lot of fun. And again, another group of people that were not normal decipher gamers, or I don't want to say normal. They were not veteran decipher gamers. Um, and I worked on like a little bit on tribbles every once in a while. They call me in and say, we need a few cards for this. Um, but another thing that happened about the same time, right, right before Lord of the Rings, actually right after Lord of the Rings. Well, anyway, the dot hack product, mm. every, everything that we had that came to us as an IP and eventually they would come to us and they would ask like me and Tom or some of the designers and say, well, what do you think about this? You think we can make a game out of this? Like they, I read the script to the movie Van Helsing and they said, can we make a game out of this? And I said, this movie is terrible. <laughs> the one was. Was, that was, uh, who was that with? Um, Hugh Jackman. That's right. And was it Kate Beckinsale? It was the female lady, which, you know, at the time I read it, I didn't know who the actors were going to be. So that didn't bother me. The story was terrible. It still is terrible. Um, so they would do that, uh, uh, and so things came from top down. It was, is your electricity going out there, dude? Yeah, I'm not sure. I, 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 just, just keep talking. I, I don't know what's All going on. Right, okay. It's right. You're recording. It's fine. Electricity. It's like everything is going wrong. That's very <laughs> it's okay. We're, we're we're 37 minutes in, and we're not starting over. So. All right. Okay. Good. <laughs> um. So, uh. But so everything was top down. The the somebody would come to the, uh, the, the lawyer and, and Warren and everybody, and they would bring things to us that they thought were good ideas. Uh, but uh, Tom's wife, Kathy and me had been playing the dot hack video game a lot. And we said, you should get this license. And I said, okay, we'll go talk to him. And I talked to Ross, the vice president. And I said, we should get the dot hack license. He said, the what? And I said, it's this video game. He said, okay. So I kind of had the impression that I don't think it costs very much. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, we were like, let's do it. So uh, uh, Mike and Reynolds and I designed that game. Really lots of fun. Very not the cipher game. Very good at showing the way that it was a game about an online game, a game about a game uh, in which you had a party of three uh, PCs uh, who would then fight monsters. It was all about that. So uh, and then I went on again, the barnstorming tours. I'm going to demo a dot hack for you guys. And there were guys who told me, I've sold more dot hack than I have ever sold a Magic the Gathering. He said, it's really, really hot here. And I said, that's great. We found a lot of places like that. So uh, I very much enjoyed that. And I can, I can, I like working on that game a lot. And I can tell you a secret that usually what happens when a game is not going to be made anymore, you know, a couple months ahead of time. Right. So I invented a name for, I think the sixth, a uh, fifth, fifth or sixth, the next dot hack set. And I said, uh, they said, is it going to go, well, what's the game doing? What's the next set called? And I would tell them it's called Isolation or Infection or whatever the hell it's called. Uh, and they said, oh, that's great. Okay, great. That's really exciting. And I knew it would never come out. <laughs> but in terms of interviews, it was great because it kept people going. Because, you know, I, there have been times the games have ended for, for companies and they've said, well, this is going to be our last set. Well, if you do that, nobody's buying the last set. Trust me. 
they're just not. <laughs> well, you know, like gamers don't want to be stuck with product, just like stores, right? They don't want to be stuck with extra stuff. Absolutely, um, yeah. So I, so you know, so I kept the fires burning, as you might say. But uh, the, the Die Hack game is a very special for me because it's the only one I know of that the designers said, "Hey, let's do this," and everybody said, "Okay." And I presume we made money because we made a bunch of sets on it. I don't know if about. I, I never played the Dot Hack game. I just never really got into the IP. But I, so is is it mechanically one of the most sound decipher products? I'm just curious. Uh, I think what it does, it does very well. Oh, the funny thing about it is when we were working on a Lord of the Rings game, I stood up <laughs> and I made a declaration. I said, I'll tell you one thing the Lord of the Rings game should not have. And they said, what? And I said, it should not have destiny draws. It should not have <laughs> destiny numbers. And they said, well, why not? I said, because every game we've ever made is at destiny numbers. And they were like, okay. So that was fine. And then after that, Mike Reynolds and I went to work on the dot hack game and we were playing it and we needed, honestly, it's like making soup. It's like the soup needs some more salt. It was like, there's not enough variance in the combat. It was just, you know, a bunch of numbers, two is more than one. And we did, well, you know what we need? We need dusty numbers. So at the next meeting, I said, we have decided we're going to add dusty numbers to dot hack. <laughs> wait, wait a minute. You just told us it doesn't work for I said, no, I didn't say that. I just said, I didn't want to do that. After a while, and we've been doing this a lot, after a while, it is a toolbox. And it's a mechanic for this and a mechanic for that. And we used to talk about it like making soup because it can't have too much of this. It can't have too There has to be some sort of balance. If there's too much variance, nobody wants to play it. Uh, so you kind of have these knobs that you turn up and down for. Making um, things work like that. Chuck, I, have a, I, I do want to get, I have a bunch of questions from the audience. That, okay, um, yeah. I do want to get to those, but uh, I had a few more questions, just broad questions for you. Sure. Uh, I, I guess what games do you admire as a designer, right? You know, I, I'm sure you've seen a lot. Are there certain mechanics or games like that's just super freaking cool, right? Like, well, there's always Magic the Gathering, which uh, you know is the the big daddy. I I spent time at a convention with Richard Garfield, and he's just a great guy. And mm. uh, so his second game. Uh, which was called Jihad, also Vampire the Eternal Struggle, by far the best uh, multiplayer game, I think, of any CCGs. Loved the IP, loved the implementation of the way it worked. Uh, the mechanics were very different, um, and I really loved that game a lot. I play it today. Uh, and I guess another game that recently that I've, I've worked on a little bit, so I guess I'm biased, I'm not really very biased. Uh, the game Clank is a board game that involves deck building and also a kind of a push your luck system for running into this dungeon and coming back out alive with stuff. And uh, I very much enjoy playing that game a lot and it's expansions too. We, we might just have a, a total, like a separate conversation on Clank. Clank is one of my favorite sort of board oh, that's games. That's great, that's great. And um, again, I have one thing I designed on that, the footprints. Mm. There's footprints on the map. That was me, yeah. <laughs> At least you yeah. got like I, I feel like I had so many work products. I'm like, I don't know what I did on this anymore. It's done. <laughs> you know, it's, I know. It's... I know. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, okay. So, what about the most overrated and underrated game? Uh, I mean, for me, most overrated is probably uh, from a mechanic standpoint, like Yu-Gi-Oh. Like Yu-Gi-Oh. Just like, I don't know why oh, it's man. still around. <laughs> like it's just. Know. I don't know how people play that. I don't know how people read those cards. It's like 20 years though. It's 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 behind Magic and Pokemon. It's like the third most popular game and has has had so I think I would say Yu-Gi-Oh. I mean Magic you can say is overrated, but it's also just like a really good game, especially if you get rid of some clunkiness or play in a constructed format like a cube. It's very sure. fun. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I you know, we looked at everything and we said this Yu-Gi-Oh game is pretty pretty popular. Why are people playing it? We're like, "Oh man, I don't get it." <laughs> so that, that's um, my pick for most overrated. Um, yeah, for overrated, uh I would and this is going to sound really weird, there's a game called Dominion which had a mechanic which is again, which is in Clank, which I was just talking about, the whole deck building uh business with auctioning cards and picking up cards. That's a marvelous mechanic. And the first time I played Dominion, and we'd all finished our deck. I don't remember what the criteria was for ending the game. And then I said, and now we put these decks together and we play with them, right? And they said, no, no, we're done. And I was like, that is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> what? I've, the most fun part is not building the game. There are many, many people who would rather build a deck than play a deck uh, and would build decks for others and not play them, which is fine. I was never that guy. So I was very disappointed in Dominion and very excited when new games came out. There was one called Thunderstone, which was 
vaguely like Clank in that you were venturing into a dungeon. Uh, and at the same time, Ascension was another game. There was a vampire game that I don't remember the name of, uh, but you would fight, uh, you know, with your decks while you were building your decks. Dominion was, it was like, uh, it was like a Euro game of, of making statues or something. My statue's done. Look, it's got more victory points than your statue. So I felt very bad about that. The mechanic was fantastic. And the game I thought was very overrated. Interesting. Um, all right, let's uh, move into some actual questions. I polled a bunch of communities on Star sure. Wars, Lord of the Rings, Young Jedi, kind of everything. So um, let, let's chat. So the first thing... I don't know who this came from anymore. I, I didn't attribute the questions, but if you could change one basic design things of Star Wars CCG, what would it be? Wow, I think that's very obvious that uh, we would add a stack to it like Magic has because that's what we did in Wars. And everybody that used to be playing Star Wars CCG hated it. <laughs> we really felt like we're not telling you that cards work in a different way. We're just regimenting exactly how they work to explain it to people. And they were like, no, they didn't like that at all. But yeah, that was the thing that bugged me the most about Star Wars was its timing system. Um, all right, what about the next one here? I have, was Star Wars CCG supposed to be such a complicated game? Was there yeah, ever we concerned were... about the complexity being a barrier to entry? <laughs> oh, when we were making the game, we thought, oh, we'll just make it as complex as we want because it's Star Wars. No, we didn't think that. Um, like I said, the original game rules were pretty complicated. We were, none of us were expert designers in 1995, so... I don't think anybody could really look at that and say, hmm, that's a lot to read. Uh, but like I said, when the uh, the Hoth, I, was the Hoth the first set that had a rule sheet that was just kept unfolding? <laughs> and, and then when Cloud City came out, right after I went to work for the company, they said, here, edit the rule sheet. I said, my God, is this bigger than the Hoth one? And they said, yeah. Uh, so I thought that was crazy. Um, but every game has design creep. And uh, that's not, that doesn't mean one of the designers is creepy. That means that, because of power problems and just the fact that somehow you do the easy things first, the things that are easy to explain and intuitive, you do in the first set and everything else is using more words. So, uh, you know, it was never, the only thing that we did in Decipher is we had text boxes and we had, uh, we never, well, there was some, <laughs> there was cards like Attack Run that it was all a text box, but I don't want to get into that. But basically with your average card, we had this much for lore, we had this much for game text and it had to fit. So we were using Quark Express <coughs> and when we wrote cards, we were them right into Quark Express, not into a spreadsheet anymore, just to see how they'd look. And we had ways of, of kerning and moving out space and spaces in between words uh, that put more words on the card that tried to do what we wanted to do. But basically there was kind of a limitation there that's really the only limitation we had. And I don't know how many words that was exactly, but if you look at one of the regular cards with the regular text box that was really full, that was the limit, basically. Yeah, Star Wars CCG seems like now that I'm reflecting back on it, you know, years later, it, it had too many mini games that felt like pet projects, like Sabacc, Pod Racing, The Senate. Like, I know they're pseudo alternative win conditions, but they're just... I don't know. It makes it like, oh, here's the, the six page rule supplement on Cloud City Sabacc, which is different from Jabba's Palace or Trooper Sabacc. Right. It's like, right. do we need to have these mini games? Maybe they, those uh, are things that I think you could ignore if you wanted to. I imagine a lot of players did. But uh, um, yeah, well, those were if you ignored it, you still need to have some knowledge. I'm like, OK, wait, you're my opponent's playing it. So wait, how does this work again? I got to give you a card. What? what? You got to like, be ready just, for it. I played yeah. a guy in Magic this morning that had a horribly broken deck, and I was like, oh, I got a card for this. So, you know, I got my sideboard out, and I beat him in the second game. It was fine. Uh, but, yeah, it was a way to add value without technically adding complexity to the base game, maybe. Mm. That's the way we might have looked at it. I don't know if that's right. <laughs> nobody wants to make something really complicated. I mean, nobody's proud of something that's complicated, I hope. Unless you're uh, like a, a lawyer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of have a follow-up question there that that's kind of related. Was there any major game mechanics, unique bank game mechanics that were were sitting there on the idea floor that were later abandoned? Right? You know, I, I, I I'm just curious what like what could have been, right? People are always asking questions about things that we thought up and we abandoned them for one reason or another. And I don't, you know, whatever they were, we probably saw the flaw with them pretty early. And we just abandoned them and never thought about them again. So I can't, I really don't have any examples. I'm not telling you that never happened. 
because it certainly did. But, you know, iteration is the key in game design, uh, which is why, for example, you're working on .hack, and me and Mike Reynolds, and Mike Reynolds said, we are going to make a paper play chess version of this now. And I said, well, you don't have this all figured out. He said, now. We're going to do that now mm. and play it and see how it works and have other people play it at the very beginning um, and then play it again and then change it and then play it again. So that's how games are designed. And um, so things get thrown away all the time in, the, in that process. And um, I mean, like I said, the original, play Star Wars sometime without four strain and see how that goes. Where you could have sure. a battle wherever you want. That's how the original game went, and it was like, well, we got to fix this. <laughs> um, what about what about sets and products? You know, before they came out, this can be sort of career wide, but what what sets or products are you most nervous for their release, and and why? You know, you're thinking like, oh, this might be broken. People are going to be upset. <laughs> it's already out there. Uh, you know, people talk about making broken things. Uh, somebody once said in one meeting that we had that somebody said, I think people like Decipher's games because they're balanced. And all of those designers looked at each other and said, no, that's not how it works. Because um, <laughs> what you want to do, nobody wants to make a game where everything's balanced. That's like, what is that, Canasta? I don't know. So uh, there's this line of this card is really strong, but this card is broken. And what's the difference there? It's a very small difference. And you want to walk right up to that line, make something that's cool, different, exciting to play looks broken <laughs> and then when you play it it's not it's like oh it's okay it's fine uh and there has to be a few cards in a set every set has cards like this if you don't have cards like this you're not done yet um there have to be cards that are really close to that line you hope they're not over and then sometimes you make asteroid sanctuary and it ruins the entire game completely and then you gotta fix it <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I think of sometimes, you know, especially dead CCGs where it's like you had 10 sets, they're printed, and the meta has been solved, right? And like, this is the optimal deck. It's it's like solving a puzzle, right? You're, you're essentially grabbing pieces from 10 different sets. And like, oh, I remember this set card from set two. If you pair, pair that with something from set 10, yeah. you know, you, you're going to win very quickly. Uh, and so I feel like also, game design have, is preventing that. We also have what I call the 10,000 man play test, which happened the first day the game was released. Because we're playing it, we have, we spend a lot of time internally playing the game. We have outside play testers like I used to be, send them the stuff, let them play the game. Hundreds of games, maybe, maybe thousands of games are played. And then the game's released and there's like 10,000 games played the first day. Mm -hmm. So what, one of my favorite ones was, and I don't, I can't do all the math. I, if I looked up this card, I could find out. There was a card, a dark side card that let you play it by using your life as a, your, your, your cards as a, I don't know. It was really broken, but it was like, we were on set six and this card was from set two. Those are the ones that really get you. Cause we, I don't know, you know, but what if you play this card and they're like, holy crap, this is, you know, and most of us didn't get it. We're like, we need to see you play this deck and somebody would play it and we go, oh yeah, that's broken. So uh, I can't remember what card that was, but I can, I can well, find it, out, but it's funny at all like the Star Wars CCG objectives where it's like, oh crap, actually if they play the following four cards, this is this is screwed. So, you know, it's like opponent cannot play whatever, Imperial Barrier, you know, the following four things. Yeah. Otherwise, this is, uh, I, which is actually a good transition to a question that a few people pose, which is wh why was Decipher against ban lists or really eradicating, eradicating things you know, seriously? It seems like they just wanted to do card fixes rather than banning cards and, and magic just went the ban route like oh this is broken i think uh, what you're asking is why do we make 30 cards that mucked with uh uh sense alter and control uh when we could have just banned those cards or, or read them and the answer is that was a thing that magic did that we didn't do that was mm -hmm. on the list of things we're not going to do say no we're not going to do that so, i mean defensive yeah. shields added like this 15th layer of complexity of the game <laughs> and it's essentially a bluff it's like okay they're not gonna play asteroid sanctuary because they know there's a defensive shield more than likely their opponent's deck and therefore da, da, da. And it, it's a de facto ban but it also adds in a si another sideboard or it just I, I don't really like shields but i you know understand the purpose they serve as you know essentially a ban list uh, the idea was it's not a ban it's different but we're going to say you can't play with this and then we're going to give you something else to do and a lot of that something else to do was like there was one about have a lot of X wings and Y wings in your deck. It was like we want you to play a bunch of cards that you haven't played before. Mm. You know, and it was just like good story stuff. There was a card that we made 
what did it do? And we had some very experienced play testers by the time things like objectives came out. And uh, he came to us and he said, you can't make this card. I said, well, you don't like this card? Have you played it? He said, you can't make this card. I said, well, you think there's a problem with this card? He said, you can't print this. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we changed that card. Um, okay, my, my next question here is talking about sort of the later sets that never came out for Star Wars CCG. I think there was a Skywalker set, there was a Jedi Masters and Scoundrels. What, what cards from those sets ultimately made it to print? I understand some of them got kind of thrown into Reflections 3 or... You know, they always I, I, had new cards in them of some kind. Yeah, I uh, I was not working on this stuff back then, so I couldn't really tell you. But uh, um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, well, what about? I, I, guess... I can, let me tell you that I, I told you before about my lying to people about the new dot hack set that was going to come out. Well, when we printed when the Lord of the Rings card game first came out, there was a little card that came with it. That this are the this is the name of the first nine sets. Okay. And we stuck to that and we got all those sets came out. But I talked to a designer from L5R and he said, he got up at a meeting and he said, look at this. Decipher has nine sets planned out. They got them all ready to go. But what are we doing here? We're just messing around. We've got to do, we've got to think like that. Do we have those sets figured out? Oh no, we just had names. Now we had some idea how it was going to work. We knew there was going to be, again, then we were moving toward through the story like we did with Star Wars somewhat. But there were sets after that that I think we stuck to that came out. Um, so that plan ahead stuff, uh, goes a long way in making people happy. So I would suggest doing that again. <laughs> I mean, it's also kind of like a bluff, right? It's, it's a, a bluff to say like this game's going around for leads for nine sets. We're not going to yeah. pull the rug out. <laughs> so if you look back at the sets that came out in 1995, the fact that so many of them didn't make it to two sets, much less something like nine, but I, I, I tallied it up one time. There's over 200 CCGs that came out in the nineties, 200. Man. And most of them are just, you've never heard of this, right? Like every random Buffy had a game. I think that actual one's fairly popular. It's like, there are so many dead CCGs out there. I like um, Buffy game. Yeah, Buffy game's actually okay. But, uh, yeah, but yeah, I'm, like I have a big book of what I would do is I would get some new, I'd, I'd get the Buffy game or whatever, and I would get a, a card back and I would want to get a card of each card type. Okay, then this, 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 this. And I put it on, that's a page in the binder, turn to page, next game. I have three of these binders and they're huge. They're really thick. I have hundreds of games in there. And still, as soon as I got on the, the dead CCG group, it was like, what is this game? Holy crap. Never seen it before. There were a lot of games. <laughs> there are. Uh, so I guess going from Star Wars CCG to Lord of the Rings, what are some of the big lessons learned? Because Lord of the Rings feels uh, like a more elegant experience. I mean, it's, it's shorter, right? I, I think that the 90s taught us that the ideal length for a game is 15 to 20 minutes, not an hour plus, which... Star Trek and Star Wars both war, but magic, you know, it's 15 to 20 minutes. Could be less if you screw up in the first two turns, yes. <laughs> but like it's something that's lighter and easy to play. And you can always do commander if you want more, but um, Lord of the Rings is a quick game, right? You can play it in 15 to 20 minutes. And it, was that one of the big lessons learned sort of the timing, quicker gameplay, more interactiveness. I, all of the, all of those are good things. I think the thing that we learned the best was uh, making main characters much more available which is mm. why in the first set there were three Frodo's. And that was, that's a thing that it, in some cases has become pretty much an industry standard. I think that things like, uh, like Wizards Star Trek game and things like that would have multiple versions of characters like that. So, um, but for us, that was the biggest problem because people would, early on people would play Star Wars and they wouldn't have a Luke or a Vader or anybody. They wouldn't have, they'd be like Bo Sheck would be a guy from the movie they could barely remember. And that would be the only person they got in their starter decks. And that was a big mistake. So I really feel like we we helped fix that problem very well. Um, so how much playtesting was spent in draft versus constructed? Was Premier tested separately from A New Hope much? Or were they play tested together? Uh, a lot. I, I, the very first playtest I went to, as I left, there were I my plane was earlier than everybody else's. I walked out and I saw people playing a four-person game of Star Wars CCG. And I said, wow, how's that going? And they said, better than you think. But that was about <laughs> the only research we did on that. Uh, I don't, draft was a thing that we added later on. I don't think that uh, any of our games, except for uh, dot .hack, uh, dot .hack was one of the mantras for that was nothing starts on the board. You just shuffle your deck and play. There's no locations. There's nothing like that, which uh, Decipher was really crazy, weird. And a lot of other games work that way. So that was really good draftable. But I think the idea of drafting something like, 
uh, Star Wars or Star Trek where you have to have all those locations is crazy. Um, I was never, I'm still not much of a limited or draft player. That's not the CCG I came to play, you know, not as Garfield intended it. God damn it. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to, this deck is a expression of my personality. I built it myself and I've worked on it really hard. And then you can meet me. It's okay. But the draft uh, thing is like, the draft thing is like, we shook this box and this crap fell out. You got to make a deck. And I was like, nah, I'm not interested in that. Anyway, so uh, there was drafting going on. I don't, I don't think our games were very well suited for that, which is a big problem because drafting is awesome and makes a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, and I, I love drafting because it's like you get to have the best part of building a deck and yeah. it's, I mean, that, that's one of the biggest problems with, with, with card games, right? It's like your opponent has a $600 deck, you have a $60 deck, you're going to lose more than likely unless, and the, the drafting removes that a little bit, right? I mean, the fact is like if your premier to Hoth deck has five Vaders and you couldn't afford any, then well, you're going to lose more than likely. And So we both drafted in the same pod and you got four rare cards and I got one. Yeah, what's the difference? Yeah, that, that's fair. Um, but it's okay. I, I, it's okay if you like drafting draft I, it's a great thing it's a great way the to illusion of fairness right <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's a different kind of balance there let me tell you that i you know i think it's great i think limited environments are terrific i'm um, not just i'm not just saying that because they make money <laughs> they, they do yeah they make money and you never play the cards ever again yeah, essentially <laughs> two hours of use and they go in a shoebox I got a couple more Star Wars CCG questions, and I got some Young Jedi and Lord of the Rings uh, to wrap stuff up. Sure. So with Star Wars CCG, how far ahead were sets planned? So some key concepts for later sets were in process early, but you know, special editions, operatives, Dagobah, those led to some pretty crazy strays that had to be just deconstructed completely. I'm, I'm just kind of curious there. Well, the general plan for all the sets, I mean, if you can see, don't count. Special edition was an app, something different away from the plan but in terms of like i said they knew Dega, but wasn't going to have many light side characters they knew when we got to work on uh endor which was you know set eight of nine i think or maybe I, maybe my math is terrible it was the one I, I kept saying well what about uh the asteroid belt so, the, uh, every time i asked about something they said no that's in death star 2. no that's in death star 2. no that's in death star 2. it's like what do we got left ewoks they said yeah ewoks so uh <laughs> That was that was rough, but that just shows you there was a plan from the very beginning as to how that was going to work. Yeah, uh, they also did things like, I don't know what set Ewok Parade came out in, but there was a card called Ewok Parade that referenced your Ewoks because they knew there was going to be Ewoks, you know, five sets later. So when it's time for the Endor set, you have to figure out what Ewok Parade does. <laughs> so that was a very strange thing. Um, but we figured them out in Star Trek. There was a set, I think the set called All Good Things went back and, and filled all those you know, plot holes or whatever you want to call them that have been created by earlier designers who thought that stuff was funny. I never made a card like that. <laughs> um, okay. Wrapping up the, the sort of star Wars CCG stuff. Um, what was the most exciting time and the least exciting time during the star Wars CCG lifespan? Boy, there was a high and there was a low uh, for me. Uh, and not just because I was working on it, but we went, we, made the young jedi game and it came out right before the first star wars celebration which was a rainy muddy mess here in denver and uh as we we would go there were tournaments of course and we would walk around the tournaments and we look at each other and we go people are playing yj and that's really cool i think they like it that was very very exciting because when you're you know at some point you get some cards like they'll do some proof printing or something on the, in the print and then somebody will bring you a card and say, look there's a printed card from that set you designed say, oh that's great and then you'll see decks and then you'll see it on the stores but then eventually there's a tournament and there's people playing the cards you design and that's the best and it, with yj it was kind of a rush process and the fact that it came out and it did pretty well uh we were very excited about that so that was the best uh the worst was uh 1988 decipher con when the operatives came out and it was decided that before the convention, we would give all the people who qualified <coughs> for the finals tournament uh, a box of uh, uh, cards that they didn't know anything about what they were. So we give them brand new cards. That was the special edition that had that had uh, operatives in it, right? I think that's yeah. what that was. And then there were people walking up and down the halls late at night at the hotel saying, anybody got any Kashyyyk operatives? Because everybody wanted to have about 30 in their deck. So, uh, and the operative SIG was a disaster, just a mitigated disaster. 
Um, there were people who were threatening us with violence in the parking lot. There were people who were playing the tournament and they said, I'm not playing an operative deck, Chuck. I'll show you how to beat those operatives. Well, he didn't do that because the operatives won all the time. So uh, that, that was a... That was a mistake. It was part of, there was another idea as we were working on special edition. Wouldn't it be cool if it had the same number of cards that premier did, which was 324 or something like that. It was a big, yeah. Cause we were making sets that were like 180 cards. So we kept adding cards and adding cards and adding cards. Then we had these operative things and they had cards that were the art department had dredged up that were pictures of shadows or people's feet or something. Um, so those were the operatives and that all of that was bad. The, the, the giving them the cards before the, tournament was bad uh the actual experience of playing was bad and uh that was that was bad everything you thought it was bad um okay i got a few more questions here uh because sure. i i recognize that whenever we go over an hour people should just go watch a movie rather than listening to us prattle so <laughs> we're gonna hey we don't do this every day it's special man no it is and we might do a follow-up on just some more stuff because this is just a very fun conversation to have okay. um all right, talking Young Jedi, staying on Star Wars stuff, but were there plans to expand Young Jedi past the sets we got? And what do you wish was different about the ones that were released? Well, I think I mentioned this before. Uh, the characters didn't have game text on them until set three. I was wrong. We should have yeah. been putting game text on characters in set one. That would have been fine. And it would have, I guess it would have made it more complicated, but not much. And it would have given us so much more design space. The question with Young Jedi, you always talk about design space. What if we do this? This mechanic lets us do a lot of things. Okay, well, what if we do that? Well, so Young Jedi was very restricted from the beginning in terms of design space. It was supposed to be three sets and we were supposed to be done. And also they were supposed to be coming out two months apart. It was supposed to be bang, two months, bang, bang. And I think the second set was like nine months later or something, which was terrible. So it's very easy to get bored with a small set of cards in nine months that was only supposed to last two months so that wasn't every two months is such an aggressive schedule i'll just throw that out there yeah but uh, a lot of it i mean if you look at the way the game was designed it was we could design almost all three sets uh at the beginning so yeah you know, uh okay last young jedi question is where did you get the images for some of the cards i don't remember anakin having so many friends in the movie right oh <laughs> yeah sure uh every time there was there were a lot of things that were like costume fittings um for characters that never appeared in the movie um or background characters everybody it's like let me tell you a story we had a uh a 35 i don't know a big uh movie we had the film of a movie of of star wars new hope and we had a giant uh the thing that editors would use it has two big reels and the film goes right between it and what we would do is when we found a a, a frame with a character we liked look at that wolfman guy we would cut the frame out and then send it to somebody to scan it and then we would get it back and then the artist would work on it and make it good so as you rotated through this movie it's a version of the movie on the film strip uh it would go pop 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 every time there was a frame missing and when you got to the cantina it was like there were so many characters that we got out of the cantina and a lot of those were given backstory by the guys doing the west end game or doing the novels but other stuff we just made up yeah um so let's move a little bit to lord of the rings uh so you worked on the first few sets for lord of the rings right and mostly one and three and i came in for another one that had some sauron cards in it i'm not sure which one that was so, so I'm curious, like print run and the conversations around it, like print run seems to be much larger than Star Wars CCG and including seven foreign languages. It's like they went all in, They're like we need German, we need Italian, we need French. <laughs> Let's toss out some Mandarin, right? And I'm just yeah. kind of curious, why was this such like a, I don't know, like we're all in seven languages. Why not start with three? It seems just like a very aggressive strategy. The translation was because we knew that Lord of the Rings was very, very popular in many, many, many other countries. Uh, that Star Wars was not so much, but more of a more of an American phenomenon than Lord of the Rings, which is very well beloved by many, many countries. Uh, which is why the rarest card in Lord of the Rings is we used to call it, I think, the French Troll, which was a promo card that came out um, at the French Gen Con. And I don't know how many were given out there, but there were not many. And that was supposedly the rarest promo card to get. 
Interesting. I, that's actually my next question is what's the rarest card in, in Lord of the Rings TCG? I, I knew there was some like weird promos, the falls of Raros foil or some stuff that was unreleased, but I'm just, so do you think it's this French troll? I think so, uh, which is interesting that it's a troll, <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, again, I'm not a collector and I had a kind of a weird situation where I had extra asset. Uh, I, I could probably get cards that I needed to get from work. Um, so it's like, you know, Tom and I would go and play in Star Trek tournaments at the local store and they were like, don't these people know that we have access to all the cards? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, yeah, I think so. Um, as far as print runs, I don't know. I, I, I believe there's still a warehouse full of, of Star Wars premiere somewhere because they printed so much. They printed, they set a print run and then right before the print run actually happened, they said, let's double it. So... <laughs> You know, that's that's what started the whole warehouse problem, that there was so much stuff laying around. Yeah, and uh, people forget how big a goddamn warehouse is, right? Like, you, you can have... We oh, have our own warehouse. One. That that has uh, 12 cases. That, that the, you know, three cases are in that box, and they're, they're stacked to the ceiling. The ceiling's 18 feet tall. Like, you can have so much product that, that just is stacked up and... Uh, a pallet, which, you know, what is it, like six feet square or whatever? And it's stacked up six feet high with, with cards. That's a lot of cards right there. And uh, when I was working for the little company that we made back in 1981, there was one pallet that had all of our stuff. But when you go to the warehouse, the Star Wars warehouse was like, you know, this is Cloud City, which is just, it's like skyscrapers of Cloud City. So, yeah. And I, I think for the collectors out there that are like, oh, my God, there's so much printed. Yeah, but so much of the stuff was lost. I mean, a lot of people pitch their cards. 25 years is a long time, and that's why there's pro – there's, I don't know how much of it was lost, but uh, I just know so many friends. Basement, mom threw out my cards, dog ate them, wife lost them in the divorce, trash. Uh, stuff goes missing over time. <laughs> and Yeah, it does. Uh, so – uh, let, let's kind of close out here with just some general decipher questions. We'll, we'll, we'll do some warm, fuzzy ones. What's your fondest memory of working at Decipher? Um, well, Lord of the Rings. I I, don't, I can't begin to tell you uh, when they said we were going to get Lord of the Rings that all of us got all starry eyed. You know, you think these guys would be jaded after working on Star Trek and Star Wars and working on famous IPs, but Lord of the Rings was just the best, just mm -hmm. the best you can work on. So, really excited. Uh, Magic recently made a set and they did such a very good job. And I watched those guys talk about that set. They have a weekly thing where they talk about the new cards and they were all the same way too. They would say, Oh, we got to work on Lord of the Rings. It was so awesome. That's yeah. just the best. So yeah, every, all the time I spent playing on working on that game was, was the best. Um, what about, someone just wanted to know what was Warren Holland, the, the CEO of Decipher like to work with? Cause it, I mean, from, our hour plus discussion here he seems to be great, but I, I'm just kind of curious what your experience was with him. I was lucky to work for a couple of guys that were just fantastic CEOs, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, Warren was the first one, yeah, because he listened to us. He let us, when we had something to say, we could just, his. he kept saying his office had a door and it was never closed. It was never closed as far as I was there. And he would make time for you to hear what you had to say. If you had a question about, I remember asking him about dot hack extra rares or something. I said, do we need to do this? How should we do this? And he said, what do you think we should do? And we ended up doing what I said. So, you know, he listened to us. He was immensely supportive and um, he's a nice guy. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you, but uh, it's everything I would want in a boss for sure. Yeah, no, that's, that's uh, I, I love to hear that about, about bosses. I think too many of them uh, are not nice guys. I have had uh, some that are not, yeah. So I, I'm curious, do you have a favor? I know you're not a collector, you're a player, but do you have anything from your time at Decipher that, that could be kind of seen as a one-of-one? One? Like, I'm the only guy with the premier beta, I don't know, something like this. Like oh, a yeah, yeah. I have a thing. I took a picture here because I don't want to move my camera because it'll just fall over again. Wait a minute. All right, let's see if you can see this. On my, oh, that's I'm going to make you I'm bigger gonna, on here. That's, that's not how it's supposed to work. Okay, wait a minute. That's not what I want to do. It's it's okay. okay. If, you, if, if they've made it this far in, they can wait a second to see. All right, that is a uh, Cloud City promo poster you may have seen before. Yep. Uh, and you'll notice it has lots of signatures on it. It does. Well, I was at a play test, and it was my birthday. So this says "Happy Birthday" up in the corner. Uh, all the play testers, all the designers, 
everybody. And it also has uh, Jeremy Bullock's signature right there. And he has the most fantastic handwriting. So they had a bunch of posters signed by Jeremy Bullock. They took this one and everybody else signed it. Uh, so that's very nice memories of those times when we went to the play tests and uh, all the camaraderie we had and joking around. And a couple of people said, uh, you know, stupid things. Um, but uh, yeah, it was great. So that's a special thing that I have that I saved. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, let's let's close out today. This has been a ton of fun to talk, but let's close out with your dream IP, current or past, to create a game on it. It sounds like it might be Lord of the Rings. Just do more Lord of the Rings stuff. But <laughs> well, I'm curious if you have sort of a dream IP. So we like talked about all, all the things that I worked on. I also worked on Valstar Galactica. I did most of the design on that set, which was awesome. I have stories about that. Uh, what else did I work on? Stargate, uh, more Star Wars games after I left Decipher, uh, three or four more. Um, I worked on a Magic the Gathering game. Um, and what else? Elder Scrolls, uh, Skyrim type game. I got to work on that. Um, so after working on all those, and again, that, that was my expertise and my preference was to work on licensed products like that. But the one that got away from me was Marvel Comics. Mm. which pretty much is my religion uh, because whenever they make a movie, I go to the theater. Nothing else puts me in the theater. So, <laughs> But I've been reading Marvel comics for six decades because I'm really old. So that is the one that got away for me. You know, that would get me out of retirement in a minute. <laughs> well, we'll have to keep that in mind. Um, there, I guess there was versus system, but, um, you know, that kind of ran concurrent with a Star Wars CCG. And anyways, yeah, that's a topic for another day. Um, <laughs> I think we have lots, lots more to discuss in a future episode. Chuck, I'd love to chat with you again, but I think that's all the time we have for today, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Like, subscribe. If you made it this far, you're definitely all those things. So I'm not really worried, but uh, really appreciate you guys tuning in to, to listen to me and Chuck talk gaming. Thanks so much for, for uh, joining us and we'll catch you next time.